Uh, yeah, here to talk to you about the blockchain. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the blockchain? OK, simply put, the blockchain is the protocol that uh, Bitcoin, which I assume everybody here has heard of, is built on top of. The internet we use today is the internet of information. The blockchain is the internet of value. The one is a communications protocol, while the other is a value exchange protocol. What made the, the internet of communication so successful is the fact that uh, it was an open protocol that anyone could innovate and build around. And what makes the, the blockchain protocol uh, interesting is that same, that same thing. If you wanted to innovate in finance or payments or any of these sectors, there were no real open systems. A lot of those businesses would have built, built on a sort of geographical basis and often limited to those areas. By having a, a baseline protocol that allows you to build and innovate around finance, lots of interesting things can happen. So to, to describe the protocol in its simplest form, it's a distributed database or a distributed ledger. It's public, it's transparent, it's really, really fast, and it's very efficient or cheap to utilize. Much in the same way that the Internet of Information or the communications protocol made it possible to send information instantaneously anywhere in the world, you now have the ability to transmit value. Value being, again, broadly defined. Uh, Bitcoin being a, an alternative currency or a global currency that runs on those rails. Uh, but governments have the ability to issue uh, their own currencies on those rails. Uh, recently, the Philippines just announced that they're looking at putting the, uh, the peso on the blockchain, and there's some reasons that'll be interesting. Uh, if we want to go to something a little bit more out there, we could talk about things like voting. You know, in democratic societies where we're given a, an ability to vote, a token can be issued. I have the ability to, to transmit or send that value to, you know, whichever of the candidates I want to elect, and now that can be done with a public distributed ledger that is uncorruptible. Uh, and I think very interesting in terms of the implications that that can provide. I don't know about here in the UK what it's like in terms of uh, buying real estate, but in the United States we've got title insurance. Uh, and you pay a fairly significant fee for a firm to take a look at that chain of title and determine if the person selling you that real estate actually uh, owns it and that the title is clear. The blockchain is a chain of sort of transactions. It's a ledger that's saying here's who owns what, here everything's time stamped, and it's that chain of title. Now, once a transaction was done on the blockchain, you would have the ability to say, I know that that, that title is clean. I don't need some third party or intermediary to, to tell me that, it, that that title is, is, is clear. And so this is what I mean by a, uh, a distributed ledger, and it's got a lot of interesting uh, use cases. Most of the time, people have, you know, kind of, again, stopped at hearing of Bitcoin and going, I don't understand why that's important. Why do I need it? But if you start to look at things like, uh, well, to use that example in terms of us in the developed world, you know, in the United States or here in the UK, uh, we've got mature sort of banking systems. Probably all of us have a bank account, I would suspect. We've got mature payment systems in the sense that there's payment systems that are prevalent and available. Most of us have plastic in our pocket and have the ability to go conveniently pay for things. And, uh, you know, we've got faith in the commercial system. We've got rule of law in theory that's there to protect us. And of the 200 currencies in the world, We've got currencies that all of us, or most of us, want more of. Uh, but when you start to go south of here, or south of North America, you start to look at Latin America. You start to look at places like Southeast Asia. You start to, start to look at places like Africa. And you'll start to understand why an open protocol like this has the ability to transform the world. So from a retail perspective, uh, I think the two most important points here are that only about 25% of the world's population has the ability to buy things online. This protocol is going to democratize the global financial system in a way where every human being on the planet with a phone will have equal access, expanding the total addressable market by 4x. That's a fairly substantial thing as we look at you know, expanding our businesses, as we think about globalization and uh, our businesses participating beyond our, our local markets. It also has the ability to expand your margins substantially, certainly for retailers. Uh, you know, a lot of retailers, if you're selling you know, consumer goods, uh, you could use margin expansion. The payment systems we use today are relatively expensive. So I'm going to take us in a deeper dive down, you know, sort of Bitcoin uh, and the blockchain and uh, the innovation occurring here and how that could, uh, you know, potentially impact the retail markets. Again, I think I've done a decent job of describing this, but again, what is Bitcoin? What is the blockchain? It's a global peer-to-peer -peer payments network. It's open to all with a computer or a smartphone. It's open source. It's decentralized. 
There's no sort of middleman or governing authority that's needed. Again, it's a peer-to-peer -peer system in the same way that uh, if I transact with you in a store paying with cash, uh, uh, there's no sort of intermediary required. To do that online today, that's not possible because uh, uh, you need some sort of intermediary. This is the, the closest, thing that's, uh, uh, closest thing to digital cash where I can transmit on a peer-to-peer -peer basis over long distances. Uh, and there's no issue or require in the, say, in the case of Bitcoin. Uh, many of you have probably seen kind of the sensational headlines, you know, Bitcoin, Silk Road, Mt. Gox failing, uh, the price hitting 1,000, the price having come down. And so some people are going, well, I, I don't know if this trend is continuing. Uh, because the price itself is the main barometer of sentiment, but if you actually look a layer deeper and you start following the sort of fundamental metrics, which as someone like myself that spends all my time in this space, I do, uh, you're seeing substantial wallet growth. We've gone from just over a million people a year ago to now about 7 million people today. So you're seeing substantial growth there. Merchants, there was only about 10,000 merchants a year ago. You're now looking at something you know, quickly approaching 100,000 by the end of this year. So you're seeing merchants recognizing the benefits of this. Uh, revenues, those merchants were essentially processing nothing last year. You're seeing substantial numbers now. Bitcoin ATMs, which is again for, most people don't realize this, in the United States, there's 70 million people that belong to the category of what we call the on or underbanked. Uh, there's actually, and, and I don't know what those metrics are here in the UK, but there's a lot of people that still are, need to operate in the cash-based economy. And so these Bitcoin ATMs have been rolling out all over the, uh, 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 the world and you've gone from zero to 250 and you'll probably see 500 by the end of the year and probably 5,000 by next year. Uh, lots of Bitcoin addresses. The venture investment in this space is also interesting. Uh, last year you've had about $30 million of capital flow into the companies that are building the infrastructure. So if you think about the underlying protocol in the same way that we think of the internet, the internet as a protocol was not all that useful until you had things like a browser, until you had things like an email client. So the baseline protocol is not really usable by us as consumers. So in the same way that internet startups in the 90s built out the infrastructure and ecosystem to make it usable, in the same way you've got that going on here. About $30 million was invested uh, prior to this year. And so far this year, we've now exceeded $400 million having come into the sector, which is the same level of investment the internet saw in 1995. Except for in 1995, it was very, very expensive to build a website, to build even a basic business. Today, because of software as a service, open source platforms, things like AWS, that capital is going to go a very, very long way in terms of building out infrastructure, though it does take a little bit of time. That money doesn't turn into product overnight. Uh, so I think you're going to see a lot of innovation uh, coming out of there. Obviously, a lot of companies that have been uh, financed. And I think the most important part here is this network hash rate, which is this, the Bitcoin mining, which is this distributed system. People have... Um, they, they run the Bitcoin or blockchain software as a way of earning uh, coins, and that's a, a financial incentive in the same way you'd run Skype because you want low-cost voice over IP or you ran Napster for other reasons. Um, but uh, that network is now about 280 times more powerful than the top 500 supercomputers in the world, which is what's securing that network. Uh, and GitHub repositories, lots of important sort of fundamental metrics showing sort of the activity in the space. Now, where is mass adoption likely to come from? Uh, remittance is an important part. You've got a $550 billion a year industry. That's pretty much Western Union, MoneyGram, these types of businesses. Uh, on average, they're charging 10% fees. And again, these are the people that are participating in the cash-based economy, sending money back home to the Philippines, for example. Uh, the Philippines has got a, uh, I think 28% of their GDP comes from money remittance. And you know, there's obviously a lot of leakage in that way. Now, with a value exchange protocol like this, I have the ability to send money back to the Philippines for a fraction of the price, and uh, that can be very useful. And as I said, the Philippines is looking at putting their money on the blockchain. In that country, you've got 100 million or so people, and there's only 5 million credit cards and debit cards. On average, I'm, I'm assuming the people that are banked in that way probably have more than one. So you're looking at less than 5% of the population uh, having the ability or having access to the payment systems they'd need to shop with any of you. With the blockchain, a country like the Philippines can now uh, allow their entire pop population to become banked or have you know, high quality financial services overnight and the ability to shop at low, with, with low expenses, the ability to transmit money back and forth. And if you think about it, the developed world is here. The developing world, it'll probably take them 10, 20, 30 years to catch up to where we are and they'd have to spend hundreds of billions of dollars. The Philippines now in a matter of one or two or three years 
could have financial infrastructure that is on par or even better than what we have in the developed world, much in the same way that Africa leapfrogged wired telecommunications and skipped right to wireless. It's called, we don't have any of that fixed infrastructure. You know, what is it that we could roll out to, you know, to actually you know, put these systems in place? So remittance is one of them. Uh, early adopters, you know, young people are finding this obviously uh, very interesting. It's, it's cool to be you know, playing around with whatever's the latest and greatest. You know, if we get and go south of the border of uh, the U.S., you look at places like Venezuela and Argentina, where you go out and go shopping for a, a phone or a, a radio as a way of storing value because those economies are falling apart. Uh, and again, uh, uh, you've got sort of progressive societies like Iceland uh, that were you know, significantly impacted by the uh, uh, global financial crisis. Here's another interesting point from a payments rail perspective that may or may not affect you. Uh, that is microtransactions. Uh, the payment systems, again, we use today were designed in the 1950s. And there's a sort of fixed minimum cost of call it 70 cents a transaction for anything to be viable. You now have the ability to transact you know, and send someone a penny or send someone five cents. I think this is going to have a pretty big impact on content creators. Um, Right now, if I run, you know, if you look at the cable industry, for example, in the U.S., there's a debundling sort of process going on because, me as a consumer, I don't want to have to pay for 200 channels when I only watch four, and so this concept of a la carte sort of consumption of content is occurring. Uh, so, and from a microtransactions perspective as well, the video game industry has already migrated into these type of transactions, mobile markets as well, uh, in terms of playing games on my phone. But instead of paying $20 for a Financial Times subscription, I'd rather be able to read half an article and say, I like this content on a freemium basis and pay 25 cents to read the rest of it. Uh, so this company in particular I've invested in, ChangeCoin, uh, has created a, a tipping product. So when I'm on Twitter, Reddit, YouTube, et cetera, if I like someone's tweet in the same way like on Facebook, I would like something, I now have the ability to like your product, to like what you've posted, but actually send you monetary value where I'm saying, here's five cents. And then once you've started receiving money for the content and things that you're doing, people are, are sending it back and forth. And this company is just, in the last two weeks kind of uh, uh, taken off in a, in a fairly interesting way. So I think the whole sort of microtransaction rails are interesting again as you look at emerging markets. A dollar is a lot of money for some of these people. So here are the, uh, from a retail perspective, the, the main reasons that you should be uh, accepting digital currency as a, uh, as a payment. And it, it really is, there's no reason not to. Uh, Every, I, I can't envision one company or come up with one good argument why someone shouldn't do it and I'll go through the reasons. Low transaction fees, if you look at other payment systems, it's substantially lower. Uh, it's somewhere between, call it, a penny a transaction and on the really high end, 1%. Uh, and if you think about um, other sort of payment uh, rails, if you look at credit cards, for example, most people think, oh, credit cards or PayPal and these things cost maybe 2% or 3%. The reality is they normally cost you between 4 and 7% because you don't, you don't have just the payment processing fee but you have a number of sort of anti-fraud systems, you have to have, uh, uh, you've got chargebacks, you've got an entire sort of group of people there to support your bit, you know, to support and prevent you from being defrauded because these payment systems were built on trust. Again, systems built in the, uh, uh, in the 19, call it 50s. And so uh, your transaction fees are much, much, much lower. There's no per transaction fee or it's very small. Can't have chargebacks, all transactions are irreversible. You can't have fraud, though there can be theft, which is why that's marked that way. No rejected payments is a pretty important one. Uh, there's a lot of people that want to purchase product from you. Uh, they're going through the flow, they've put in their credit card, whatever it might be, and that payment's been rejected and you've missed out on that opportunity. They may pull out a second card, but the idea that, again, you don't have to trust the customer that's purchasing from you, this is the reason why only 25% of the world's population can transact online. It's because you have to trust them. The minute they can pay you with digital cash, you don't really care. Um, and so that's, I think, a pretty important one. You have none of those sort of MCC, PCI, sort of international issues or compliance required. Uh, again, in the, if, if you think about from a payment system, when, when you make a purchase with a credit card, uh, you're actually handing over all of your financial credentials uh, to that merchant. Uh, you're not saying, I'm, I'm just paying you know, the $70 for this particular product. You're actually handing over those financial credentials. And if those credentials ever become, become compromised, someone has the ability to exploit those things. When you're using the blockchain, again, in the same way that I said it's, it's a trustless system, you're only authorizing that exact amount of the transaction and nothing more. And your credentials are never af actually leaving uh, your own control. And as a retailer, there's actually, I think, some important compliance and uh, uh, benefits, as we've all seen with Target and Home Depot lately. 
the companies that are in the space today, the payment processors that will allow you to process digital currency payments, uh, they are saying, I understand, you don't, might not understand what Bitcoin is or Dogecoin or Litecoin or Ripple or Stellar or any of these currencies that are out there. The payment processors say integrate our APIs, it fits into your systems just as easily as any other payment method you might add. We'll accept those current, that currency on your behalf and we're going to pay you out in euros, dollars, whatever it is that you might want. And I think I'm out of time. Am I? I don't know. It's flashing red. Um, anyway, th th that's what the payment processors do is they'll accept your uh, uh, currency on your behalf and pay you out in whatever fiat or government issued money you want. They handle all that processing for you. That can be integrated on a white label basis. I was going through a, a payment flow here. Uh, a transaction because you have to ask for less information can uh, take place in a matter of, uh, call it 20 seconds to go through a flow, which uh, is what you would see here. Phone comes out, take a picture with a QR code, transaction is final and paid. How it works, uh, I think we'll, we'll skip past this. <laughs> and so some of the things that you, would, you might want to think about from a retailer perspective is because you've got substantial cost savings through the payment method, you have the ability to pass those discounts on to your consumers, which I think can be a very effective way of you know, competitive, you know, being competitive when offering your services. Um, so I think uh, you want to think about you know, how do you incorporate you know, these new payment methods? How do you get a lot of promotion out of these new payment methods? And how can you pass along some of those savings to, uh, uh, to encourage people to spend more money with you? Uh, this is uh, one of the companies I'm an investor in, GoCoin in particular. Uh, it's a currency agnostic platform. I'm not sure if Bitcoin is the Friendster, the MySpace, or the Facebook, but uh, I'm a huge believer in the blockchain. Uh, I agree with Mark Andreessen and many of the, the people that have come out and said that this innovation is more substantial than the internet and it's going to impact the world around us more so. If we went back to 1994, it was very difficult to envision all the ways that the internet would impact our businesses and it's pretty much impacted all of them to date. The blockchain, uh, I think, is, more, is going to have an even larger impact and there's many of us that see that. As to what currency does it, difficult to say. Uh, PayPal's recently partnered up with, uh, with three of the companies in the space and if anyone has PayPal or Braintree already integrated into your, into your systems, you have the ability to turn on these payment options uh, instantaneously with the flip of a switch and you're seeing, I think, a lot of the other major sort of uh, payment processors implementing these as options. Companies are signing up, again, lots of merchants, this one in particular being mine, and uh, I think I'm out of time. But if you're a bank, if you're a traditional credit card network, you've got regulators on side. So they're going to push for as long as possible to make the retailers not trust this network, no? Um, yes and no. I mean, the, the one benefit of banks is that they are uh, generally very capitalistic. They dislike regulators probably as much as we do. Um, but uh, uh, from their perspective, I think they're going to see opportunity. Uh, and I think that we've seen that. If I had to uh, say the thing that I was most surprised by over the last couple of years, I would have expected far more significant regulatory challenges than we've seen. I think that people are starting to recognize the, uh, the value of the blockchain, whether that be large banks uh, becoming incredibly friendly uh, to, again, not necessarily Bitcoin, but the blockchain and the innovation that it presents. So, um, uh, yeah, it's going to be in the same way that we've seen two steps forward, one step back, but I think the opportunities it creates are substantial enough that uh, uh, I, I don't see this, uh, this trend coming to an end. Hands up anybody here who has ever spent or received a cryptocurrency, a Bitcoin, or one of its peers. There's two hands there, three there, four, five. Hey, this is a cutting edge crowd. It's about nine people here. We are at Wired. <laughs> hey. Thank you, Brock. Thank you. <laughs>